Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through Autobiography of an Idea by Louis Sullivan. And I'm delighted to have my friends here. Uh, this is just a very special meetup for me. You know, I get to talk to Rob and Sherry on a weekly basis. I get to talk to Maritza, I get to talk to Joya, I get to talk to Rupali. And um, I wanted to just say that, you know, Rupali's contribution has been amazing because mm -hmm. she's bringing in her experience in education and applying Louis Sullivan's ideas to, uh, to education. So it's, uh, it's, it's been great. So uh, let me get started. Uh, this is unusual because I'm participating as a panelist in this one, uh, in Autobiography of an Idea. So I wanna start off by putting something in the chat. Last time I said that this was the big idea. See, we are doing autobiography of an idea. So what I'm doing is that I'm identifying the core idea that he has spe specified so far. And then we will work, I'll, I'll work on what, how that idea morphs. The best idea that I have so far that explains everything that is going on, I talked about in the first, for the first chapter one and chapter two was his quote. Life was beginning to break in upon him from the outside. A continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside was to shape his destiny, okay? That first part is important. Life was beginning to break in upon him from the outside. The start is outside, outside in. You have nature, that you have, you have reality and you have to start with that. You have to take that in, that is the source, that is the starting point. And then there is this continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside that shapes his destiny, okay? So that process is the heart of what Louis Sullivan uh, is about. At least that's the best formulation we have so far of his idea. And I did, I picked, I think six different examples last time. This time I have four. So I'm going to, again, keep repeating this quote. And then I'm going to give you four examples. First, the spring. The second, his family. It's very interesting. You know, people don't think of it, but it's very interesting that his family. Third is his reaction to church. And fourth is his territory. So those are the four things that I'm going to I'm going to focus on. All right. So let's start with spring. Um, I promise last time there was a lot of vociferous complaining, um, kind of bittersweet complaining, sweet because everybody said, oh, he's reading the paragraph I love. And second, oh, I wanted to read it first. Uh, but so I'm not going to read everything this time. Okay. So, so before we come to spring, there is this quote, he says, any kind of weather suited him or rather he suited himself to any kind of weather for he was adaptable by nature, which meant in this case, abundant glow, glowing health. Now, this is a huge point. This is saying that you take life, you know, you take reality, you take nature as given, you start with that. And you suit yourself to that. You know, you, you do not complain about fundamental patterns in nature, okay? And then he describes this glorious spring, okay? Again, I'm not, I'm going to leave the descriptions to others. But again, this is the heart of what he's saying. You now, when you read his, uh, the big book, the system of architectural ornament, he talks about always remember the seed germ and how it grows. He describes how he focuses on it, how he follows everything, how he actually digs up a seed to say, what's going on? I've been giving you water. Why have you not sprouted yet? And he digs it up, finds that it has actually sent 
send out roots, but because he dug it up, it doesn't grow. So he is communing with every little aspect of the spring and is completely enthralled by it. He says, were not things moving? Was not something moving with great power? Was there to be no end to this sweet, clamorous joy of all living things, himself the center of it all? The new, the marvelous world of springtime in the open, a world that became a part of this child that went forth every day, a world befitting him and destined to abide with him through all his days. So he's not watching spring as if he was watching TV. It's not passive. It becomes a part of him. It's not just deep appreciation, but actually acting out the spring in him, himself as a person in some form. What wide flung spread of enravishing splendor, the child became overstrung. Yet his heart found a relief from suffocation in his running about, his loud shouts of glorification and of awe, his innumerable running returns to the house to say breathlessly, come grandmama, come see, come see. He wished to share his joy with all. This is another part of his expression, of his reaction. This is breaking in from outside. And the core part of it is him going to his grandma saying, look, see, look, see, come see. That's what he's doing in his autobiography. Okay, he has lived this life and he's saying, look, look what is possible. Come see, it's the same impulse on a larger scale. So again, look at this principle, a continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside, okay? The spring is breaking in, he's just awestruck by it. And he's expressing it in his own way by actually working with these growing things and in his expression and sharing it with others. So that is the point about spring. So again, coming back to, you know, life was beginning to break in upon him from outside. Now, life is very complex and people are integral part of that. Most people, when they think of a statement like this, they think about just an individual person and nature. But now, he has this entire cast of characters around him. But before that, I want to talk about one other characteristic of him, which shows the limit of this process. We're talking about the continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside. He's identifying the limits of what is being done at this stage and what is not being done at this stage. In that process, he says, the more discerning, uh, you know, he says to, to the passerby, he was a stout, stocky, miniature ruffian, let loose upon the helpless world. The more discerning noted two fine eyes, clear and bright. He saw all things just as they were. The time had not arrived for him to penetrate the surface. He wished to know about these, he wished to know what it was that enthralled him time after time. And in this, he failed also. He could not interpret. Few can, for that which perturbed him lay far deeper than his thoughts. A living mystic presence within the self same open that was his, per contra, he was generally regarded as a practical little fellow who liked to work. So this is the sequence. He's talking about the sequence 
of learning. He's doing things, but his ability to, and he's driven mostly by emotions and instincts. His ability to formulate concepts is still very limited. And he's, he's clearly identifying that. All right, so now we go to his family and his family is critical part. And I was astonished to see both who these people were and how he describes them, how deeply he actually understands the core functioning. Okay, let's start with his father. You know, he has kind of, he has shown a little bit of dislike for his father, but at the same time, the love of nature is something that he has picked up from his father. He, and that he sees, and he actually accompanies his father on this seashore when he's going boating, all of that. So this is his description of the father. Now, this is all four different approaches to religion, but I want, want to just first put down these characters, okay? And then talk about what, what they mean. So there is his father, he says, what he wanted was not a priest or a preacher, but a thinker and an orator. At last he found in Theodore Parker, the satisfaction of his quest. Going alone, he attended regularly. From this, it may be inferred that he learned, he leaned towards Unitarianism, nothing of the sort. He leaned towards oratory. If Unitarianism went with it, well and good. So you can see that, you know, he has nature and he has appreciation of some kind of art. He has appreciation of dancing, of music, and that's what he brings. And Sullivan is in contact with that. Now he comes to his mother. Mother had a fixed idea that existence was, a continu was continuous in a series of expanding becomings, life after life, in a spiral ascending, ever ascending until perfection should be reached in a bodiless state of bliss. This ethereal belief open to view the beauty and purity of, his, of her heart. So that's his mother. Now, grandpa. Grandpa looked upon religion as a curious and amusing human weakness, as conclusive evidence of universal stupidity. Okay. Um, but at the same time, I want to just jump forward and look at more important things about his grandpa. He knew full well However much grandpa ridiculed, ridiculed so many things, he never poked fun at the solar system. In this domain and the star-laden firmament, he lived his real life. This was his grand passion. All else was trivial. The vastness awed him. The brilliance inspired him. He kept close track of the movement of planets. He read endlessly about the moon and the vast fiery sun and the earth's spiral path. Grandpa went forth in the early hours of the night to make vigils with the stars, to venerate, to adore this panoply of constellations, to be wholly lost within the splendor of the sky. Here was the man, all else was husk. What communion he held within the stillness of night, within his own stillest hour, no man shall know. So that was grandpa. And then there is grandma. Grandma alone was devout, devout. Quietly she believed in her God, in the compassion of his son, in the wondrous love he bore, a love freely given to the outcast, a love so great, so tender, so merciful, that for its sake he yielded up in agony his earthly being the supreme sacrifice to the end that all men might be blessed thereby. And that as his mortality passed, his supernatural love might be revealed to men throughout all time, that his divine being ascended through the firmament to join the father in the glory of the throne of heaven. Perhaps now she was, he's talking about, um, he's talking about his grandmother. Perhaps this is why um, 
grandson loved her so this is not about it's about the fact that she just believes this she just holds this this is she's guided by it but she's not really worried about what other people are thinking about it the innocent of creed of doctrine and dogma he loved her because she was good he loved her because she was true he loved her because to his adoring eyes she was beautiful such was grandmama otherwise grandma was a responsible head of the family consisting of herself her husband her son and her grandson she was methodical orderly knew the true meaning of thrift entered every item promptly in the account books struck the monthly balance had a fine mind for figures and withal she was prudently generous the point i want to make is that here are these four independent thinkers who have their own take on the deepest ideas deepest ideas deepest philosophy they have their own philosophies at the same time they like each other and they're interacting with each other and he's interacting with all of them he gets at the heart of what makes all of these people tick and he gathers from them what he can so this process of life breaking in includes people and that process within them that's what he's taking in he's taking in the love of nature from his dad the power of music and emotional expression from his mother the awe for the universe and the skepticism for all human foibles from his grandfather and this moralness the purity of virtue from his grandmother and he he takes in all of that and he expresses that in his person he does that for everybody whether it was the shoemaker he goes and watches what they do takes that in um now when you are taking in such things it is important to say no to things that don't fit in with that and there are two big examples here one is that of the church and second is that of the school i'm going to leave the school alone for now just going to look at the church climbing a wide flight of stairs to the second floor all entered a large dim barren room and reached the family pew louis immediately felt a pang of disappointment there was nothing here to recall an echo of the spring song he had shared in the open he thought there should be looking about at the congregation he was astonished to see the array of solemn faces why solemn and the whispering silence why whispering what was to follow what was to happen he inquired and was hushed he awaited and then he observes the entire proceedings and this is his reaction to the child however as a first violent a violent ex experience the total effect was one of confusion perturbation and perplexity one particular point puzzled him most why did the minister when he prayed clasp his hands closely together and so continue to hold them why did he close his eyes why did he bow his head and at times turn sightless his sightless face upward towards the ceiling why did he speak in whining tones why was he now so familiar with god and then so groveling why did he not shout his prayers as he had shouted and roared through his sermon why did he not stand erect with flashing eyes wave his hands clench his fist and pound his big bible and walk first this way and then that way and then and otherwise conduct himself like a man 
He seemed to be afraid of something. What could it be? What was there to be afraid of? The child suffered. Nothing in this new world agreed with his own world. It was all upside down, all distorted, cruel, and sugary. It was not like his beautiful springtime. It was not even like his beautiful winter. There was no laughter, no joy, as he knew in these things. He began to feel distinctly that his world, his life, which he had frankly felt to be one, was being torn into two. Instinctively, he revolted. He would not have the beauty of life torn from him and destroyed. These things he did not say. He felt them powerfully. A tragedy was approaching. He was about to lose what he loved, what he held precious in life. He was about to lose his own life as he knew or felt life. He rebelled. He lost confidence in the minister. He no longer believed what was said. More than that, he soon disbelieved everything that was said. He was regaining his freedom. He rebelled against in, again in spirit, this time so ardently that it was thought prudent at home to release him from both Sunday school and church alike. Okay, I think this is a huge point. You have to say no to something that does not fit into the core idea that is shaping your life. If you don't do that, you die to, to whatever extent, but you die. So that is, and that he sees that, sees that um, so, so powerfully. Um, same reaction to, to his school. Louis became moody. Day by day, the hillside school and its doings irked him ruthlessly. In wood, field, and meadow, his friends, the birds, were free. Why should he remain within these walls imprisoned and sad? He was a child of sudden resolve. So uh, again, it's the same, same saying of no. And what does it do? It opens this entire domain for him. Um, I want to, uh, I just want to kind of summarize one thing about it and then I'm going to leave, that's the next chapter. So I'm going to leave it for other people to, to expand on that. But the core thing from that entire chapter, this entire chapter, is that he develops his own domain. He says, this is mine. He carefully puts down the boundaries of it. He builds dams. So now it is building of dams. Uh, okay, I have to read. Sorry about that. I have to read this one quote about the dams, okay? Uh, so he builds this dam and then it, he builds up the pressure of the water on the lake that is dammed. And then he says, now was at hand the grand climax, the meaning of this toil, all this toil. A miniature lake had formed and the moment had arrived. With all his strength, he tore out the upper center of the wall, stepped back quickly and screamed with delight as the torrent started and with one great roar, tore through the tore through in a huge flood, leaving his dam a wreck. What joy, he had, he laughed and screamed. Was he proud? Had he not built the dam? Was he in high spirits? Had he not built this dam all by himself? Had he not planned it in advance, just what happened? Had he not worked as hard as he had seen the big men work? Wasn't he a strong boy for his age? Could anything at school or at home compare with this? Okay, so this is again him. This is him breaking out in response. He makes that domain his own and then he builds on it, sees what 
he can do and builds that up it's a different level of action the outward movement here is a level higher than what was there in the first chapters all right um so i want to you know again end with the quotation which i will put back in the chat here life was beginning to break in upon him from outside a continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside was to shape his destiny thank you next up is sherry that was great shrikant thank you um thinking that shrikant was going to do this i did a little bit of different <laughs> approach <laughs> and i'm glad um <clears throat> i want to i want to bring apart two different details in here um in these two chapters and um ask that you think about the what we all learned in the kindergarten chats and what we've seen from all the buildings that um, all that I showed that some of the other people out panelists showed during um, our kindergarten chats discussions of Louis Sullivan's buildings of his ornament. Um, and I think we're going to be able to start seeing some of the Louis Sullivan that we see in his buildings as an adult, we're starting to see them already here. <clears throat> and in this first uh, chapter we're reading, and then came spring, uh, notice also um, the similarities between these major events in the natural world that happens in this book that we see. Also, he's duplicating essentially his own experiences with nature when we were when he is the teacher and he has the student in kindergarten chats so remember we start there too um well there we end with the spring but we have these moments where we get to um the nature so <clears throat> as i'm reading this part here about the spring i want you to think about um those Sullivan buildings that have the ornament that starts simply like a stalk at the bottom of the building and works its way up the columns and then flowers as it turns outward in towards the street. So think of those Sullivan buildings as I read this. Out of this commonplace bare earth, indeed now hidden within it, was to arise a spectacle of entrancing beauty. The rains became showers, occasionally sparkling in the sunshine. The winds became mild breezes. There settled all over, or over all, a calm, a peace, an atmospheric sense that caressed and encouraged. And thus came spring. The grass appeared as a delicate deepening influence of green. Did not the child soon find the earliest pussy willows, the first crocuses in the garden? Did he not note the delicate filigree appearing as a mist on a tree and shrub and the tiny wild plants peeping through the damp leaves of autumn in its favorite woods? Did he not really see things moving? Was not the filigree becoming denser and more colorful? Was not the grass actually growing and the tiny plants rising higher? Was not the garden becoming a stirring thing like the rest? An outburst of bloom upon a peach tree, cherry and plum, evoked an equal outburst of ecstasy and acclaim, an equal joy of living. Was not something moving? Were not all things moving as in a parade, a pageant? Was not the sunshine warm and glowing? had not the splendor come upon him as upon one unprepared. He heard the murmur of the honeybees, saw them burrowing into flowers, fussily seeking something, and then away. And the deep droning of the bumblebee, the chirping of many insects, the croaking of the crows, as the flock so black, they flew heavily by, and the varied song of many birds, riotously shaping all one 
uh, all on one great tomb with bees, insects, flowers, and trees. Were things not moving? Was not something moving with great power? Was there to be no end to the sweet, clamorous joy of all living things, himself the center of all? Could he stand it any longer? And then all of a sudden, the apple orchards sang aloud. And this, of course, goes on and on. He's talking about these wonder orchards. I think we're seeing his love of spring as the origin of his ornament. That is the thing that draws him the most, this climbing and filigree and then bursting out at the top. I think we start seeing his ornament at the very earliest ages. This is the thing that draws him, that is the love and the joy of the world. And that's what he chooses as ornament in his buildings. Um, there are several points in here in these chapters, again, where we hear the same thing I mentioned last time, where Sullivan is the one who sees things differently than others. And on bottom of 41, he talks about, well, Shrikant read this too, a dis dis discerning noted two fine eyes, clear and bright. He saw all things just as they were. Um, the other thing that I want to point out, and Srikant didn't read it, yay, <laughs> um, is his love of the workers. And we'll see this in many different uh, descriptions. Um, and it continues. I'm sorry if the dog barking is, can you hear that? Sorry. Um, and the dam building is one where he sees himself as, as the, the mighty powerful man building things. Um, we hear several times where he refers to them as big strong men who do wonderful things. And his, even as he loved his own idols, his mighty men, um, he is not talking about a God in these cases. He is talking about the men who build things. Um, and then we're gonna get to this Whatever is the picture? We're gonna get to right here. Where I'm oh, sorry, I can I can barely turn my one hand. Okay, so here is one of my favorite spots <clears throat> where we hear this description of um, his love of men building. This was after his work was done and his domain is established. <clears throat> And he spends an, a, a month um, there in the woods. But then he even went so far one day as to enter the stove foundry beside the tracks near the depot. He went frankly to a workman, watched him for a while and told the man he liked to see him work. The molder, much amused, said he would show him how it was all done. And Louis spent the entire afternoon there the molder carefully explaining to him every large and minute procedure. The child was amazed. A new world had opened to him, the world of handicraft, the vestibule of the great world of art that he one day was to enter and to explore. He went away holding this molder man in special honor, although he was not very big nor very strong. And I love this little detail. He then visited the rattan works, but did not like the dust and noise. <laughs> and then he just goes on. <laughs> but we have the same thing. We have the shoemaker, we have the farmer. Each of these, it's about seeing that great work is being done. What? Um, and I think that what we're seeing at these earliest stages, is we are seeing both his love of building and construction of, remember we, we hear at the very beginning, he was a child who is not one interest in, in destruction. It's always the other way. It's the creative side of things. Um, and so those two passages stand out to me as the beginning of Louis Sullivan, the architect uh, that we later see in his built work. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Next up is Rob. Okay. So, you know, it's, you it's, need to get over here though. Yeah. It's funny. I, Sherry always comes to me a couple hours before these things and says, I don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> she always, she always sits on has something really big to say. Uh, so I, I didn't know with her, everything was going on with her, if she would have much. Uh, that was great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Theodore Parker. So this, you just mentioned him briefly. So this is the influence from his father, that his father loved Theodore Parker, not so much because he loved Unitarianism, because he was an orator. But I suspect there's some Theodore Parker influence here because theater, so I looked a little digging around to find out who he was. Theodore Parker was not a Unitarian uh, uh, preacher, but he turns out to have a very important role in Unitarianism. Now, um, Unitarians have a certain reputation that, you know, somebody says Unitarianism is a halfway house, a halfway house to atheism, right? So they're, they're, it's a religion, but it's a very loosey-goosey non-dogmatic, uh, very reason-focused and secular, ha fairly secularized version of religion. And Theodore Parker was one of the reasons for that. So he was one of the people who shaped Unitarianism in that direction. And he gave a, um, it's like somewhere around 1850 or so, 1840 or so, uh, when Louis would have been a very, you know, about the time Louis would have been very, very young. Uh, he gave a big sermon uh, or, or uh, uh, um, a talk entitled something like the permanent and the transitory in Christianity. And his idea that the, the transitory in Christianity is its basis in scripture and in the stories of the Bible and in this particular religious Christian tradition that it came out of. And the permanent was the great universal truths, moral truths that, that, that could be gleaned from uh, the religion. And that was considered very radical. And actually he was, uh, uh, had to leave the church he was at in Boston because they considered he wasn't really a Christian, right? Because he basically said this, you know, all the stuff that comes specifically out of the Bible and out of the scriptures, that's just the transitory. That's just, you know, the specific details in which these great truths were presented to us. We really should focus on the great truths. And so that was considered, you're not even really a Christian. He had, he was ejected from the, he had to leave the church that he was preaching at. And then he and his followers, the Parkerites, formed their own church, which I think, I think it's now called Theodore Parker Church in Boston. Hmm. Uh, but he helped shape Unitarianism in this direction of being about talking about these you know, great transcendental truths. Uh, and basically getting rid of all the specific dogmas and uh, specific doctrines from, you know, traditional doctrines of Christianity, though, regarding those as sort of optional. Uh, and I can see a lot of influence, how that would have had an indirect, you know, he, he sort of downplays his dad's influence a little bit because he has this sort of coldness sort of for some reasons, but you can see some of that coming in. Um, and that brings me to, I love that the, 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 the two chapters go well together. It's basically the third chapter here is about how he ditches church. And the second chapter is about how realizing that he can ditch church, he then arranged to ditch school. And the common thread being, I mean, he spent a month. It kills him and he got away with this. He spends a month as a truant, truant while wandering the woods on his own. And it takes him that long to get all the cogs together to figure out that he's doing this. Um, but the the impulse behind it is this idea. And so I've talked about Louis Sullivan as kind of a figure of the enlightenment. And it's this idea of taking your cues from nature and looking to nature to set the terms for how things should be. And then when anything else uh, doesn't measure up to that standard, then the institutions and the, the, the customs and the things that you're taught by the adults, they should just be pushed aside if they don't measure up to what nature is teaching you. And that's very much the theme here. So he, uh, uh, taking uh, church first, you know, this I, that, no, Shrikat's already read all the passages, so I don't need to look them up. Uh, Shrikat read the passage about how uh, the whole atmosphere and style of the church is not what he's, the, it's not the spiritual experience that he has discovered out in nature, out in the woods. So he's wondering why is it that this church doesn't measure up essentially to this standard of, of meaning and experience that I've gotten out 
in the woods building a dam and 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 mm -hmm. doing all these other things. And then he also talks that there's a passage you didn't read, Srikant, where he's talked about, uh, I may not be able to find it, but in the school, he talks about being uh, beaten with a switch or mm. being hit to, you know, by the teacher. And he says, this doesn't happen to me out in nature. This isn't how nature teaches me. Why should the school be teaching me? And I'm sure, um, uh, uh, yeah, we're probably going to have a lot to say about that because I saw the, you know, the, uh, uh, the Montessori bells were going off when I saw that. <laughs> this idea of that nature sets the standard for how you should learn, and the school isn't meeting up to the standard of, of how nature does things. So I thought that was really interesting. You see the tremendous independence of his mind, but also the independence directed towards nature and my experiences in nature are the standard against which everything should be judged and human institutions when they when they fall short of what nature is teaching me of what nature is showing me then they should just be ignored or thrown out or rejected and you should go and you know um i love what he says when when the as the the jig is finally up um <laughs> jig is up on his uh, vacation from school oh, mm. so i love the fact that he calls this 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 uh i got it. He calls this a, a, oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. That's why I can't it find it. It says one. true and trade about here. There you yeah. go. That no, you that's not it. Uh, it's a little farther on. Uh, I love how he calls this chapter a vacation because I thought, oh, you know, he's going to, his family's going to travel somewhere. They're going to go somewhere. No, it's his personal vacation from school. And then he, he, he sums it up by saying, all was running smoothly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, you know, this is this is the ideal he has for how things should work that he goes out every day and he observes the workmen and he, he builds things in his little domain out there and he learns from nature and he learns from the workmen. So all was running smoothly. It had not in the least occurred to him that all this time he had been a truant. <laughs> um, so I, I really uh, find that to be, I think these chapters go together very nicely because you see that aspect of his this formative aspect of his life is is how and it really makes sheds a lot of light on what goes on in things like kindergarten chats where he's always bringing back to nature and talking about nature and going back to that that this was his own process of development and education uh, that he got his real education from nature and everything else had to measure up to that uh, so that's what I had to say wow. Rob, you're really liking this book. I'm delighted, and 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 you're you're, you're it's because you're, you're bringing in kind of the context of the kind of larger cultural context of where he fits in. So that's that's uh, and it's just great, and I'm delighted to see that you're liking this book as much as you are. Uh, next up is going to be Maritza. Okay, so um, my first question is about this book is the um just the absolute beauty of the way he describes so many things in nature. It's, I see poetry still in this book, similar to the way in which we saw poetry in um, the kindergarten chats. Um, it's, it's really quite, quite lovely. It does, it's like some things you have to reread them just because you get so lost in the beauty of it. You're like, wait a minute, I just missed something profound. Let me go back and read that again. Um, the, in these two chapters, um, I, I see, so, so first I was, a, I, I've, I'm having a hard time with the, um, the concept of a childhood where one has such freedom that one can actually have an entire truant mom. <laughs> I come from a very chaperoned society that would never have happened in my childhood. And there's no way <laughs> I was lucky if I got a few minutes unaccounted for. Um, so coming from that angle I'm looking at this and I'm in so much awe um but the 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 way that nature has such an impact on him it's like I constantly see him reaching for and it's like what, what Rob just said you know how he uses nature as his measuring stick for all other aspects of life it's like does it compare to this no nope, it's not good enough because you know it's not as cool as this other thing that I saw happening naturally um and he actually you know says it in some of the things here, but because he's also being shaped by external factors that are not, I mean, they're not necessarily nature, 
I, I found it really interesting. Some of the things he's the, the manner in which he writes about certain things, and she kind of touched upon it a little bit for how he speaks about his family, his familial ties. But even in like, so in the beginning of chapter four, he's what and, and Rob talked about how he's you know beaten with the switch in school. He uses an interesting, so he says he doesn't hold it against the teacher because he somehow instinctually understands that she's just doing her moral duty. And I find that to be such a serious and like very deep phrase to use in the middle of all this beautiful descriptors of nature. And, and it, it's telling because I find that he also, like he points it out and, and I, I feel like throughout these two chapters, there's a soft way in which he's telling us that our interactions with people on the outside have an impact upon us that is, it's almost unavoidable because of societal norms. Um, and that, you know, I, I get, and it's possible I might be reading into that because again, you know, my, my upbringing was really different. Um, but he's so often saying, can this possibly, you know, can school possibly compare to this? You know, when he created his dad and he's like, got this unmitigated joy and, and I can just almost feel him saying, there's nothing in school that brings me this joy. So how can anybody possibly tell me that there's value to school? And that, that measuring stick of, you know, if it's not as real, if it's not as tangible, as joy provoking, as those things which happen naturally, why is there value to them? Um, I mean, I suspect as we go forth, maybe we'll, we'll see that answered for him through, again, the outside influences that are in his day-to-day um, -day life. Um, I, I do, I'm just, so I guess to me, these, these chapters are, they're, they're this, it feels almost like a, where we've got this um, crescendo that's going up and up of, you know, this really innocent exploration and innocent unfurling of a child and his love. And, you know, we're even told, we're told at the end, you know, <laughs> spoilers, in chapter four, we're warned that it's come to a crash. Like he literally used the words, you know, and then came the crash. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not gonna be rainbows and butterflies in the next chapter or two. We can suspect that even without seeing it, right? But the, just looking here at, at these two ch chapters, I, so, another thing that is really kind of fascinating to me is the, the claiming, you know, he claims this tree, he claims this metal. But not that metal because it looks barren and sad. I don't want that one. I gotta find a way to map my land so that I go around that ugly part because I need those amazing trees over there, and I need them to tie into this tree that's mine. And 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 that's it's cool because it's like it's a very childlike wonder and perspective. But not necessarily, because technically, if you think about it, that's kind of what we still do as adults, right? That us versus them mentality is very strong within us. Um, he's just presenting it to us in a very beautiful, easier to digest format as he's shining a spotlight or something that we still do. Um, and, and he does that. And that's like, I mean, the brilliance of this mind as I'm reading these chapters, it's because I can see that. I can see that. I can see the man behind the writing and it's so well done. It's so nuanced. Um, and, and he's pointing not just to the shaping of how he becomes the man he becomes, but it's also a, a little bit of a, a view to ask us to consider aspects within ourselves. Um, at, at least that's the way I see it. And it's like, I mean, because there, when he, he describes, when he discovers sunset and he discovers sunrise, 
it's done in such a way that one really does need to pause and think about where those moments exist in one's life. Because honestly, they, that's like being alive, right? The way in which he unfurls the description of a child's first sunrise is, it's breathtaking to a point where it left me with this feeling of, I need to rethink my entire life if I cannot think in the next couple seconds of a moment that I had recently for this. Because that's the way that it's presented to us. Like it's, it's, it's this, it's the word continuous from the statement that she can't has been saying to us in, in the last meetup, which I didn't attend, but I did listen to. Um, and, and today, you know, a continuous breaking in from the outside and breaking out from the inside. And you can see both of those as he's standing there, transfixed and quiet, and it stays with him. He goes to breakfast and he's still quiet. And it's, and that to me, that the word continuous makes me feel like Sullivan is inviting me to read that accounting and to somehow make it a part of my daily life. If I don't find instances of it in my past, or even if I do, I should continue to make them happen. Um, well, and I mean, that's, that's the way I'm seeing it. And that's, that really was for me, the most impactful scene that was, um, you know, drawn for us, that the picture he painted was just really beautiful. The, um, you know, and I mean, you know, there it also was kind of really adorable to, to listen to him, you know, describe how he fell in love with the second tree and do it in such a way that he had to make sure that his first love felt and acknowledged to a point. I was like, I'm with you, bruh. I totally understand it. It's very hard to pick a favorite tree. Um, so I, for, for those of you who are familiar with Philadelphia, in um, we have this massive park in the north um, and it's um, Fairmont Park and along the water, there's so many willow trees, there's so many. And it's funny because from a distance, they all kind of look the same, right? But when you're someone who's younger and you want to climb into them to read, you get the differences. And I remember getting into fights with my siblings, my sister, because you know, that your younger sibling always wants whatever you have, even if they don't want it, they just do. So I would get into fights, I was like, that's my tree. I, I was reading there for the last three days, that's my tree. You know, she's like, but I got there first, Nana. And then you're like heartbroken as a kid because even though there's like 20 other willow trees and they kind of look the same, that one's yours. It has that perfect little, you know, nook for your second book or for whatever you're holding it to. So, so I, can, I can empathize there with this uh, need to make sure that when you have a, a second love, the first one is okay with sharing the spotlight. Um, and for those of you who have never heard from me before, I have an absurd fascination with trees. So if it sounds weird to you, I apologize. Um, but um, I have Shikant. I'm gonna have to show you a picture later. And all of you, in the Galapagos, there exists an endemic species of cactus trees that are so big. And some of them evolve to develop a trunk with no spines on it because on those on that island, there are none of the land iguanas that eat them so they don't feel the need to defend themselves so I got to hug a cactus tree <laughs> kind of awesome <laughs> okay um now I'm just going down strange paths so I guess I'm done thank you thanks Maritza we we remembered you and the trees uh during the last episode and I read the description and I said okay Maritza is not here so I, I get to read it this time this time I deliberately did not read it. Uh, next up is Joya. Oh, thank you. It's so wonderful to go after all the other panelists, but also so difficult because we've read so many of the good passages. So I might reread some of the things, but some of them are just so worth rereading. And I love following Maritza and the way that she pointed out how much these chapters do read so much like 
poetry. And of course, everyone who knows my interest in literature knows this is a huge part of what I wanted to focus on today. So with our first chapter, chapter three, which was called, and then came spring. And everyone who was on the journey with us of kindergarten chats, and sure even pointed out that this was how the climax of kindergarten chats was, and then came spring. And so I thought it was just so fascinating to counterpose it here where spring comes first and how it's so crucial to how Louis Sullivan develops. And the way I read this chapter, it really is, I see it as all about religion. Srikant pointed out how in the middle of this chapter, we get the descriptions of all the different family members and their approach to religion. Rob even gave us the great connection, the lesson on Unitarianism, which I appreciate because I did not know that. And then the chapter ends with Louis Sullivan's rejection of the church. But the way I see how this whole chapter comes together is that nature, I see, is what is the equivalent of religion for Louis Sullivan, that what awakens his awe and his sense of spirituality is this connection to nature. And what I love about this is we see, you could almost say it's a child's first religious awakening, but that awakening is the awakening to nature. And so some of these passages, I know people have read them before, but I want to reread them again because I think it is just so poetically beautiful, this description of how a young child awakens to what you might call the religion of nature. So starting out the chapter where he, he talks about how spring has arrived and he says, he wished to know just where these rivulets started. So he shoveled off the snow and broke off the underlying decaying ice until the desired point of information was reached. Then he would go immediately to another drift and operate on that to see if the result tallied with the first. This work completely absorbed him. It gave him new and exciting sensations. Then too, he would tramp over the sodden stubble of the fields and plow along the muddy roads. He would hunt about eagerly to find by actual test which places were the soggiest and just where the mud was deepest and stickiest. Then came rain upon rains, the snow vanished, earth, fields, trees, all was bare. The child took this for granted. And I love what we see here about how Louis Sullivan discovers nature, that it is such this interactive process. And we see that he comes with it with this characteristic, we're going to find approach of first just asking why he wants to know just where the rivulet started, and he's going to get his hands dirty and do the work to find this out. So we, this is what I, I see him doing throughout these chapters is you know, constantly asking questions, having this really curious, inquiring mind, and then being so excited to do the work, this literally hands in the dirt, trying to understand how things work just him and nature, this really deep connection with what is actually going on in nature. And simultaneously with working with nature, just this emotional appreciation for the beauty of what is happening when spring finally comes. And first, even this last line where he tells us the child took this for granted. To me, that's an interesting line because we see first how nature, in a sense, he takes it for granted because it is what's there. So it, it is the given. It, it's, it's the starting point. And he's also going to give us this premonition. Trikant was pointing out some of these lines where, I mean, he's going to say next that, uh, you know, he, he didn't yet suspect that hidden within it was to arise a spectacle of entrancing beauty. So we're going to discover that as Sullivan grows older, it's going to become really important to penetrate the services, not just what we take for granted. But there seems to be something so important about with the starting point of taking nature for granted, that this is how we begin by just taking all of this wonderful bounty of what nature gives for granted. And that's the important first step. And then Sherry read some of this really beautiful passage about what Louis Sullivan discovers when spring finally arrives. But I just want to just reread some of this because, again, it, the, the poetry of this, I think, is just so beautiful. And, and I, I, maybe I, I, I'm, you know, bought in with the Louis Sullivan religion of nature. And so I, I love reading it. So just to read some of this, um, was not something moving 
Were not all things moving as in a parade, a pageant? Was not the sunshine warm and glowing? Had not the splendor come upon him as upon one unprepared? He heard the murmur of honeybees, saw them burrowing into flowers, fussily seeking something and then away, and the deep droning of the bumblebee, the chirping of many insects, the croaking of crows, as in a flock so black they flew heavily by, and the varied songs of many birds, riotously shaping all on one great tune with bees, insects, flowers, and trees. Were not things moving? Was not something moving with great power? Was there, be, was there to be no end to the sweet, clamorous joy of all living things, himself the center of all? Could he stand it any longer? Then of a sudden the apple orchard sang aloud. What made them thus burst forth? Was that the same power, silent amidst the clamor? Was it a something serene, sweet, loving, caressing, that seemed to awaken, to persuade, to urge, yet to lure on to frenzy, to utmost exultation, himself and the world about him, the new, the marvelous world of springtime in the open, a world that had become a part of this child that went forth every day, a world befitting him and destined to abide with him through all his days. Oh, how glorious were the orchards in full bloom, what mountains of blossoms, what wide-flung spread of enraptured ravishing splendor. The child became overstrung, yet his heart found relief from suffocation in his running about, his loud shouts of glorification and of awe, his innumerable running returns to the house to say breathlessly, come grandmama, come see, come see. He wished to share his joy with all. And then it's interesting to me how we get this total enraptured experience of what spring is all about and how the child, young Louis Sullivan, experiences it. And then it's interesting that next he's going to contrast it. He's going to point out to us that while he's having this experience, we're in the middle of the Civil War. So um, you know, it must be something like 1863 or so, 1864, I think, when this is all kind of happening, uh, but definitely in the middle of the Civil War. And it's interesting how he's going to make the point to show that contrast that, that the war was happening, but it was just this distant thing. And partly that's because he is a child. You know, he's, he's gonna say that um, you know, he knew nothing about war. He does now. You know, there, there's the, the adult impression of the writer writing this so much later looking back on that. But I think it, it just it's interesting. It brings us, I think, into that moment where you know this this kind of universal experience of what it is to be a child and experience nature. And then to point out that he was having this incredible, truly awesome experience. And yet the country that he's in is in the midst of this civil war. And then you know, he's going to go on to tell us more about, uh, you know, how he's going to work with nature, how he gets his own first garden. I just want to read a little bit of this too. He had been given a tiny patch in the main garden to be all his own. And with toy tools, he worked the soil and planted flower seeds. He became impatient when certain nasturtium seeds failed to show above the surface. So he dug them up with his fingers only to be astonished that they had really put forth roots. He pressed them back into the earth. To his sorrow, that was the end of them. For a first attempt, however, he did pretty well. I think, again, just another great passage that shows who young Louis Sullivan is. He's out there literally with his hands on the soil and he wants to understand. He wants to understand so badly that he's going to dig up the flowers to actually see that the roots are growing. And then, of course, that ends up, unfortunately, killing the plants. But still, it's he's having this literal hands on the soil, firsthand experience of what nature is and the power of nature, how nature works. Uh, and I think it's interesting how, how he's even going to make the transition. So uh, again, he's going to tell us that, you know, he's yet to penetrate the surface. He saw all things just as they were. The time had not arrived for him to penetrate the surface, exceedingly emotional, though unaware of it, the responses of his heart, the momentary fleeting trances, the sudden dreaming within a dream perturbed him. He wished to know about these. He wished to know what it was that enthralled him time after time. And in this he failed also. He could not interpret, few can. For that which perturbed him lay far deeper than his thoughts, a living mystic presence within the self-same open that was his. Per contra, he was generally regarded as a practical little fellow who liked to work. 
And then it's interesting that the very next sentence is going to take us into the description of the father and his religion and then all the other families and their religions. Um, and so I think here we're even seeing this is the, the beginning of what you could call Louis Sullivan's religion of nature. And we're still yet at the surface level, as he tells us, there is this emotional connection and he really wants to understand what that is, but he's not yet arrived at that point of going deeper beneath the surface, but we're still there. But that this is, you know, as he kind of describes it, you know, the living mystic presence within the self-same open that was his. And, and it's interesting that to the outside world, he's just this practical little fellow that loves to work. And you wonder even how as an adult, people would have looked at Sullivan and said, oh, he was just this practical person that didn't really have any kind of spiritual life, that didn't have any kind of religion, but how he's showing you that what is his spiritual life, what is I think, you know, his religion is combined with this loving to work and, and loving nature. Um, so then, you know, we go through the chapter and I think everyone else did just a really great job of kind of describing, um, you know, the cast of characters we see, all of their uh, approaches to religion, and then Louis Sullivan's um, own experience going to church and, and rejecting church. So I just want to take us then to the next chapter, which, as people have pointed out, is called a vacation. And we learn that it's not a vacation because he goes on a trip, but it's a vacation from school. What I have to say, what I absolutely loved about this chapter called a vacation is that he spends his vacation working and learning. The whole chapter is all about him and his love of work, uh, his, his obsession with his mighty men, as Sherry pointed out to us, and and how he, he's so fascinated by working and also by learning. And to me, that honestly is the best kind of vacation. I love vacations when they involve when you actually get to work on what you're really passionate about and when you get to spend time learning. Uh, but again, I just wanted to read some of these passages here too, because again, just the, the poetry of this, I think is, is just so beautiful. So even just this description, and people have read, I think some of this before too, but again, we just see and how this is even part of what you might call his religion of nature. His religion of nature always involves working with nature. And we're, we're seeing that here. So we, we see he immediately, he got immediately to work. He gathered the largest field stones he could handle and small ones too. He had seen Scotchmen and Irishmen build farm walls and knew what to do. He was not strong enough to use a stone hammer if he had had one, so he got along without. He found a rusty remnant of a hoe without a handle. With this, he dug up some stiff earth. So with field stones, mud, twigs, and grass, he built his dam. It was a mighty work. He was lost to all else. The impounded waters were rising fast behind the wall and leaking through here and there. He must work faster. Besides, the wall must lengthen as his it grew higher and it leaked more at the bottom. He had to plug up holes. At last, child power and water power became unequal. Now is at hand the grand climax, the meaning of all this toil. A miniature lake had formed. The moment had arrived. With all his strength, he tore out the upper center of the wall, stepped back quietly, and screamed with delight as the torrent started, and with one great roar, tore through in huge flood, leaving his dam a wreck. What joy, he laughed and screamed. Was he proud? Had he not built this dam? Was he in high spirits? Had he not built this dam all by himself? Had he not planned in advance just what had happened? Had he not worked as hard as he had seen big men work? Wasn't he strong, a strong boy for his age? Could anything at school or at home compare with this? And to me, every time I read that, that's how I want work to be for me all the time. That's always what work should be, that exact experience. Another section that I really liked about this too is he also talks about uh, his daydreaming. Uh, and then the chapter even ends, that he, he's describing that when, he's, uh, when his vacation finally ends, that what comes to end is the daydreaming of a child. But I love that his daydreaming is again, still about all of the, the mighty men and their work uh, and, and what is happening with nature when you're working with nature. Uh, so he says, um, but he did not observe a spear of summer grass. He dreamed 
Vague daydream as they were, an arising sense, an emotion, a conviction that united him in spirit with his idols, with his big, strong men who did wonderful things, such as digging ditches, building walls, cutting down great trees, cutting with axes, and splitting with maul and wedge for cordwood, driving a span of great workhorses. He adored these men. He felt deeply drawn to them and close to them. He had seen all these things done. When would he be big and strong too? Could he wait? Must he wait? And thus he dreamed for hours. So it's just significant that we see that this is what, you know, when he's on vacation and daydreaming, he's daydreaming about all of his great mighty work to come. And then in addition with the daydreaming about work, we also get to see some of his first actual education. And there was a, a great description here about how the grandfather teaches him. And I'm assuming Rupali is gonna say more about this, but I wanted to bring up just a little bit about this, um, about how Louis Sullivan actually learns when he's not in school and how he's taught by the grandfather. And it's it's interesting, the, the grandfather's method here, uh, where he says, uh, you know, grandfather was willing but careful. He well knew that a child's mind was a tender thing. He was keenly observing but said little. He quietly, even eagerly observed his grandson as one might watch a precious plant growing of its own volition in a sheltered garden. But far was it from him to let the child suspect such a thing. He had often laughed at the child's outrageous frankness. It infinitely amused him. But when it came to knowledge, he was cautious, dropping information by crumbs. But this time, when his grandson in eager child, child words dramatized the sunset and climaxed all by a sudden antithesis, saying he had never seen the sunrise. How did the sun rise? Where did it rise? How did it rise? And then what happens here, we find, is that he's actually gonna go out to see the sun rise for himself, that he has to see it for himself. And again, um, kind of read some of this, but just again, to, to, to read the poetry of what, what happens here when he actually has the experience of learning what the sunrise is from going out and, and exploring it on his own. Chilled and spellbound, he in turn became impassioned with splendor and awe, with wonder, and he knew not what, as the great red orb floating clear of the hilltops overwhelmed him, flooded the land, and in white dazzling splendor awakened the world to its works, to its hopes, to its sorrows, and to its dreams. Surely the child, sole witness beneath his great ash tree, his wonder guardian and firm friend sharing with him in its stately way, as indeed did all the land and sky and living things of the open, the militant splendor of the sunrise, the breaking of night's dam, the torrent and foam of far spreading day. Surely this child that went forth every day became part of sunrise, even as the sunrise became forevermore part of him. And there's even more to say, but I'm going to leave it to the rest of our panelists, because I think we see here the child that is going to continue to go forth. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jaya. Uh, next up is Rupali. Um, <clears throat> uh, let, let, let me do one thing. Uh, so folks, after Rupali, I'm going to invite anybody who has read even a part of the book so far, to share their impressions of this chapter or book so far. Okay, so Rupali. Yeah, so that was great, Joya. Uh, and I did mark that passage. So I'm not gonna read it because you did a fantastic job of reading that. Um, I will uh, piggyback on what Maritza said. You know how she talked about the trees. She claims her own and Louis Sullivan talks about claiming his trees and things in nature. So uh, I shared earlier that, you know, I used to like going to the hills. We, we lived very close to the hills while growing up in India. And uh, my husband now was our neighbor back then. And we were probably eight or nine years old. And we were, we used, we were allowed to go to the hills by ourselves. Uh, and so we would go up there and then we would have our own adventure of finding all these uh, rocks. And we loved those rocks. And we would bring those rocks back to our home and our balconies were filled with rocks. And our mom said, no more, you cannot bring any more rocks. <laughs> but they were our rocks. And every time we went to the hills, every Sunday morning, we'd say, okay, we have to 
um, keep them in a secret place because somebody's going to come and take our rocks. Now, this whole hill is full of these rocks. And these rocks are beautiful because they have like a gray and the, a gray uh, surface. And then within that, there are blue uh, specks. So certainly there was some kind of a mineral in them that had the blue. And we had to pick the ones that had the blue and the white speckles with the gray. Um, so there was a very good you know, a uh, way to categorize the rocks that could come to our house or not. And so after our mom said that we couldn't bring any more rocks, we started bringing the rocks down and storing them under bushes and things where we could keep them secret for ourselves. And then, you know, life happened, we moved on. Um, and I came to Boston. And one day I took my students to the Harvard uh, Museum of Natural History. And we went in there to see their natural, the, the rock collection. And we're looking at these large collections of, you know, rocks from Africa with gold and this and that. And in a tiny little box was this little blue <laughs> speck gray rock. And I was just drawn to it. And I went there and it was from my hill. And I said, this is my rock. This is my rock. <laughs> and gathered all the kids and I said, come see. <laughs> So when I read, you know, uh, when he says, Grandmama, Grandmama, come see, I can tell you exactly how that feels. <laughs> so I wanted to share that. Um, but then, you know, talking about these two chapters, um, one of the things is um, what, what we learn from these two chapters is how a young child learns about things around him. And... Um, Louis Sullivan has done such a fantastic job of, you know, documenting all his experiences in this, in these two chapters. So um, both chapters focus on the work of an autonomous child. So the idea of an autonomous child is that of Montessori, but uh, we can, as we go through the pages of these chapters, we see that. Now, how should adults treat such a child? So as I was reading, these two chapters, I was thinking, so how should education be for a child who is so full of joy, curious? Uh, he makes it a very big point at the beginning saying he is of abundant health. Maria Montessori talks about children between the ages of five and nine. She says these are healthy children because they've learned how to walk, they can manage themselves, they can um, take, um, they can oh can you hear me i see that my volume uh, i i think it's good uh it's it's perfect uh jyoti uh, just check check your uh your, your speakers all right um so um maria montessori um no uh louis sullivan talks about his abundant health and the ca characteristics of a child who's between the ages of five and nine they are pretty much more or less healthy. The only thing is that they're losing their teeth and he talks about being toothless at some point. So you kind of get an idea of what age he might be at. He's so between five and nine years old in these two chapters. Um, you know, so I've often wondered in while reading this book, why does he spend so much time explaining his childhood? Almost half of the book is about his childhood. And, um, you know, how did this early childhood experiences shape him? And through those experiences, what did he discover? What did he learn from nature? Uh, clearly, he's a very curious child. He, uh, you can get a peek into his brain and how it works by the way he explains uh, his experiences, the questions he asks, the hypothesis he makes, the work that he does, and the conclusions that he draws. Because these conclusions are the ones that he carries forward um, in his adult life. Uh, and so these experiences at a very young age are so important. Uh, I've talked about education in, uh, as it relates to Louis Sullivan's life. And uh, being a Montessori teacher, I talk about Maria Montessori. So Maria Montessori calls these years the formative years from zero to six. And she talks about, you know, how a child at this age can absorb a lot of information and can acquire knowledge with 
ease because everything is coming to them. They imitate, they repeat, they do the work, and then they learn by doing that. And you can see the process exactly in Louis Sullivan's um, description. So um, the other part that we learn about Louis Sullivan is that um, he is an autonomous learner. And what does autonomous learner mean? Somebody who auto means self and nomus means loss. So self-ruling, self-regulating, self-governing. So he, um, he is a child who can think for himself. He can create his own projects. And children in Montessori schools, you can see that they are autonomous learners. Uh, and the reason is because there are three uh, elements to be in an autonomous learner. One is physical independence, right? Uh, physical autonomy. Uh, the second is intellectual autonomy. And the third is uh, behavioral or emotional autonomy. Those three things together make a child. So if you look at um, Louis Sullivan, he is capable of taking care of himself. Uh, in the chapter, it says, you know, he was a person who, uh, so let me just find that um, passage. But one of the things is uh, for being physically autonomous, you have to be able to take care of your personal hygiene, of uh, making sure that you can conduct yourself um, independently, your day-to-day -day activities. He is able to gather his resources he needs for his projects. He can climb and get his cookies and whatnot to go on his picnic. Um, in terms of intellectual autonomy, this is the ability to think independently. And children can really do that if they're given the freedom to do it. And you can see that when he's out in nature, he is asking questions, he is figuring out the solutions. And while he is thinking, he's reasoning with all of his own thoughts. And so there's a lot of metacognition going on. He's also coming to conclusions, reflecting on them, and then um, going ahead. So I'll just read this part where he says, he wished to know where these revolutions started. Then he says, this work, oh, um, so he shoveled, so he does the work until the desired point of information was reached. Then he saw the results and tallied with the first. So he is thinking back and saying, okay, whatever I'm doing and saying, does it really match with my own observations? This work completely absorbed him. It gave him new, exciting sensations. He would hunt about eagerly to find by actual tests which places were the soggiest, just where the mud was deepest and stickiest. The child took this for granted. And so the thing is that children learn by just absorbing what's around them. The third part is the emotional autonomy or being aware of themselves. And, uh, you know, how they relate with other people. Maritza talked about that and how um, he related himself to the world around him, first with nature and then with people, people in his own family. He describes them, Shrikan talked about that. And then he also talks about how uh, things that he, he saw people who didn't think like him and who he was just surprised that isn't life meant to be just so and then he discovers, no, it's not so. Uh, it also, then his dependence on people in his family and then his individuation from his parents, his, uh, you know, his own individuality is developing. So that's the emotional uh, autonomy and then managing his own well-being. Uh, one of the things that um, comes up is that he is so engrossed in uh, figuring out things in nature. And yes, he knows that the civil war is going on and he is uh, aware of the North and the South, but that really doesn't bother him. And that's a big part because, you know, we feel that children can understand a lot of things and we tell them things that uh, just make them more anxious and fearful. So there is a time he says, I'm not ready for it. I am just taking it in. And then 
there will be time when you can deliver these messages. So it's really important as educators to be careful in choosing what we share with the children and what we don't. So what's the outcome of an education that um, does acknowledge the autonomous child? And you can see in Louis Sullivan's work that he's confident. He can go about uh, figuring out solutions. He is self-aware. He is intrinsically motivated. He doesn't need somebody to tell him to do the work. He is not afraid of doing the work that the mighty men do. And, um, and he's also responsible. He's not going to destroy. It's um, one, one of the lines says that, that his grandparents allowed him to go about because they knew that he was not going to destroy anything. So he knew morally what to do and what not to do. So those are all elements that are important as part of an education method. Uh, while the children are from the ages of five to nine years, the moral values, uh, the freedom to choose, the freedom to do big work and get joy from them. So in this chapter, uh, and then came spring, he, uh, you know, Joya and Sherry have done a fantastic job of reading the passages about how spring comes forth and what joy there is in seeing that uh, how nature is just immense in its beauty and what it has to offer. His heart and mind can take all of that immense uh, information with all the drama that exists in nature. Um, so he is just discovering this great power in nature and he sees that the power that's in nature is also in him. And that is a big discovery for him in his idea of, okay, I'm part of nature. I have the same seed germ that things in nature have. Um, and you can see that elaborated in kindergarten chats when he's talking to the student about discovering himself or saying, you have the potential, you just have to uncover that. Um, so he then says, uh, you know, both, I mean, I guess everybody has talked about the school and the church. He says, well, if this freedom and power exists in nature, why does it not exist in the church and the school? Uh, and when, why, why do people need to have an external way of telling him to be a moral person or telling him to do the right thing, to be obedient. Um, so then that brings us to the idea, to, to the topic of, okay, here is an autonomous child. And what is the best way to teach such a child? Again, the answer is with what his grandparents do, right? So his grandmother, uh, let me just go to that page. So the grandmother's involved with him in looking at things through his eyes. So when she says, Grandma, Grandmama, come see, come see. And the other thing is that she's leading by example. What she says and does and lives a moral, ethical, uh, thrifty life, she is showing it by um, example. And so that's one uh, thing. Children imitate the adults around them. So to have teachers, educators, uh, parents, grandparents, everyone around them to lead by example. The other big part is where uh, the grandfather is constantly observing him. He is aware of what Louis Sullivan is doing. He is not just, um, you know, just because he doesn't say much doesn't mean that he doesn't know. So I really like this sentence a lot. Grand Grandpa was willing but careful. He well knew that a child's mind was a tender thing. This is such an important part in education that yes, children can take in, children have an absorbent mind, but that doesn't mean that they can understand all the complexities of life. And what we give to the children should be well thought and chosen uh, because Otherwise, it could just have the re reverse effect, right? That uh, it, a child who could be joyful like um, 
Louisa Levinas could also be anxious and fearful if you're just talking about things that are um, not, uh, not uplifting. So the other part is, it, when it came to knowledge, grandpa was cautious, dropping information by crux. And earlier in the chapter, he says, Louis Sullivan was learning little by little. They build knowledge little by little. They soak it in, they um, absorb the knowledge, they move on to the next step. Um, and they build on their knowledge. So his grandparents played um, an important part in, uh, in his education. The other thing that he says when he's working with his grandma is for how could he know that far, far from the scene of love, pride and joy, men were slaughtering each other. And so again, just uh, sticking to well-chosen pieces. So then the big part of this uh, vacation is the work that he does. And Maria Montessori calls it the work of the child. She says that uh, play is the work of the child. Play is the work of the child. What does that mean? So when one of our teachers um, was teaching children in India, now India is very traditional in its approach to teaching and the teacher knows best, the children sit and just passively take in the information. So here was our teacher online and the children are just having fun. They are laughing, they are engaged, they are talking, they are asking a lot of questions. And the parent called me and said, are they really learning? And I said, yeah, they're learning. And they're like, they're just having fun. And I said, but that's what learning is. Learning is having fun. Learning should be engaging. It's not just, you know, sit at your desk and uh, take in what I am saying. Um, and so what does Maria Montessori mean by when she says play is the work of the child? What she means is that, you know, at that age, five to seven, nine years old, children learn effortlessly from real life activities which produce real life results. So play is not imaginary, but it's engaging with real work, whether it's pouring water, whether it is, so one of the works that children do in the work of water is they actually create a river and they, uh, watch how the water uh, works during its flow in the river and the children are involved in the building of the river, the making of the river. So this whole story about how he makes the dam and experiences that joy, you can see that in Montessori classrooms because children are working with their hands and uh, whether they are digging um, or planting bulbs or things like that. They're all doing this real work. They can actually see the fruits of their results or if they're uh, of their actions or if their actions fail, they can learn from that. And they don't need an external teacher telling them. The other thing uh, Maria Montessori says is uh, in her book, Discovery of the Child, she says the satisfaction which children find in their work has given them a grace and ease like that which comes from music. And Joya read the part about how the bees and the trees and the insects, they all sang a great tune. And you can actually see, you know, what Marie Montessori is saying, Louis Sullivan has experienced that. So education, the method of how we teach um, should you know, really be focused on the nature of the child and not just what we believe traditionally uh, that, that it should be. So, um, I'll just uh, read about how Louis Sullivan uh, thought of work. And he says, an awakening world within, uh, okay, so an awakening world within, now aroused from its twilight dreams, its lyric setting sun, its elegy of, gloom, of the gloaming. The great world was alive to action. Men res re resumed the toil of countless ages. The child, illu illuminated, lost in an epic vision, came slowly to the consciousness of his own small self and the normal doings of his own small day. So he can now see how does he fit in 
in the grand picture of the world, of the universe. And he is aware of his abilities, of his, um, and, and at the same time knows that that work is important. He also talks about how often on hands and knees, close up, he peered and gazed hungrily, minutely at them one by one, absorbed in their translucent intimacy, indeed worshiped them in friendship until he seemed to feel them grow. That they were of his world and yet not of his world, that they seemed to live their own lives apart from his life. But he never said a thing to grandpa and grandma. They might not understand and grandpa might laugh. And we see this, right? I mean, how many, how, how often have we seen children doing exactly this? And how often uh, have adults ridiculed them? And, um, you know, we're not seeing all the connections that children are making while they are engaged in this purposeful activity just on their own volition. But um, we, we, we expect them to behave the way we think is appropriate as adults. So can schools engage children in the work that helps them learn the laws of nature and develop discipline? Uh, instead, of that, instead of going to a school that would do that, Louis Sullivan highlights um, his experiences at school. And he talks about, um, you know, then came the crash. He was having all this fun. And um, now he simply was sent back to school. He languished in misery. Uh, his help came soon, as suddenly as the crash. His father had opened a school in New Newburyport. Grandma had written to mama. Mama had told his father. Father decided that the grandparents were too soft. They had let their child grow up like a weed. They had pampered him outrageously. It was high time his son was brought to him that he might establish in him a sense of respect order, discipline, and obedience. So isn't that what teachers and adults feel? Oh, I need to teach you how to manage your time. I need to teach you how to be respectful. I need to teach you. But it actually comes uh, from within, from the work that uh, children do. And it's not. it doesn't come through exerting authority. So the other uh, part is, which is really disheartening is, uh, when Louis Sullivan talks about his teacher and says, not so at the school, teacher was not always kind. Twice with a rattan, she had whipped the palm of, the, of his right hand while he placed his free arm across his eyes and bent his head and cried. She did this uh, and said, I, I need him to learn to mind and pay attention that it was her moral duty to do so. And so punishment and discipline are often misunderstood. You know, punishment does not necessarily lead to discipline. Discipline comes from within. And whenever we talk about discipline, you know, children, the parents during our tours often ask, how do you discipline a child? And that's an interesting question because discipline, if you give the child the right environment, the choices, the freedom, then the discipline comes from within them. And when you put them in an artificial environment that does not relate to their needs, then you have to um, externally have them be disciplined. So, um, you know, I told you about my husband, uh, Rohit. So one of the things he always says is uh, the summer belongs to the children. And now in many schools, summer vacation is coming to an end. Uh, so when I, I was talking to one of my students and during vacation, Joya, you'd like to hear this. He did a business on composting. So he and his friends got together and that was his project. And uh, he was also doing some tutoring during the, the, the weeks with us. And one day I was uh, working with him and he just left the zoom call and ran away and i said to his father where did it go and he said oh his earthworms have escaped <laughs> he needs to put them all back <laughs> and so <laughs> so the thing is he was completely involved in it right um 
So anyways, when he came back, uh, we were talking about how summer vacation is coming to an end. And he said to me, you know, everybody views the year like a circle. You know, it goes from January to December and it's a cycle, it's a circle. But to me, a year is like the letter D. The curve is the school year and there's this big long stem and that's the golden summer. <laughs> And that's how he explained to me. So children, you know, uh, children have a lot of joy. But then when school starts, and I said, how would you feel when school starts? And he says, well, I'm a little anxious. And um, I, it brought me to this point where he, Louis Sullivan says, came to an end the daydreaming of a child. I mean, summer. The time to be free, the time to be able to process, take in information, process it for yourself, that pleasure is just immense. So uh, I hope all of us can enjoy that glorious golden summer for whatever weeks are left of this glorious golden summer. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Rupali. Wonderful. Uh, so folks, uh, now I'm gonna invite anybody who has read the book to talk about what they are getting from the book. Go ahead and type exclamation mark if you would like to share. Only for people who are reading the book. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Oh, just a second, I need to unmute everybody. Hold on, hold on. Uh, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, well, one thing I'm gathering from it is just how incredible his memory is, as well as to capture each one of these uh, people in his live life and actually to capture the beauty that they bring into his life specifically his grandmother his grandfather and you know in the differences that they have and how those differences have actually influenced him and how perceptive he is and essentially and how he arrives at nature in and of itself i mean a lot of the passages that you had already read is you know specifically about the thrift of his grandmother or things along those lines or what she believed in and dogma that you know, that, uh, you know, that kind of resonated with me because he still sees the beauty in each one of these individuals that are raised him, but he arrives at his own conclusions with the beauty of nature and how things essentially, uh, um, evolve, you know, uh, uh, through, there's a certain freedom that exists in nature that didn't exist within his family members, but he still learned to appreciate them. And he appreciated the workers, the people that did the work. That's what I also really uh, liked most about him. It seems like he always has a way of capturing the silver lining of every situation that he's in. Um, but one of the things that I, Rupali mentioned, I agree that, you know, discipline cannot come like externally, that it had to come internally. And I think in a way he demonstrates that, like essentially that he, his discovery, the way he's actually looking at the world, his, his whole, um, uh, um, I mean, his, his, what his month in the forest there, it's, it's, it's something that it really is something that, uh, um, it's he learns through perception and just his his own personal experience and it's i i'm enjoying reading it on a number of levels uh but it's you know those are my only comments i mean a lot of it was captured by everybody else already i mean the, most of it but it, it is a, it's a wonderful story uh, thank you joe laura what are you getting from the reading from your reading of the book uh you're on mute Go ahead. For me, um, it's a very intimate book because it's the way it's written. I paint pictures when I read, and he allows me to paint beautiful, glorious pictures of every instance. I also feel very Tao when I read his book. Um, every He's like the camel becoming a little lion cub, and that's how I read it. <laughs> that's how I read it. So. Well, thank you. Thank you, Laura. That was, that was great. Uh, next up is Jyoti. I'm also enjoying this book um, very much, <laughs> especially because I was a, a lover of beauty and nature <laughs> right from the get-go in my life. <clears throat> but what impressed me was, <clears throat> I'm sorry, what impressed me was that he was a very astute 
observer. And those observations, they were his own. He always felt they were his own. He owned them and he would share them with his family. And his family was very democratic in many ways. And they helped him to shape, um, well, they helped him to pursue his interest in, in the nature. And I'm now I'm looking at it. Well, I came from a family which was very disciplined. My, pa my parents were, my mother, I mean, my father was in the Air Force and my brother went to the Navy because he, uh, we were all very, very much disciplined. We were, I was the youngest one and I was given more opportunities to be a little bit freer than the other ones because I was the youngest one. I could get away with the murder, which my older siblings could not get there. However, what I learned from the nature that helped me later on in my life to pursue my own passions and my own hobbies, keeping in mind that my parents were not always in favor, but they were supportive. They just wanted me to become something in life. <laughs> they said, whatever you want to become, become. You don't come from a family where you are not going to become anything. So in that respect, I'm learning from this book that he, he also became an architect and he, he, the nature also helped him. But the kind of support he got from, from his family, I wish I had gotten that from my family. Wonderful. But I was not traumatized by any, any way. My, my family was sort of neglecting towards me, yet they were very nurturing towards me. So the combination of two helped me to find, find me. So this book is taking me through the rungs. Now I'm like curious to know at every stage how his observations are impacting his mind. And he developed a lot of um, milestones. He reached a lot of milestones differently than an average child would. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, I just wanted to make one quick uh, comment about school and church. And I want to contrast it to our quotation. Because that's, it's, it's, you know, when you read the quotation with the school in mind, and when you read the quotation with the church in mind, you can see the issues. Life was beginning to break in upon him from the outside. Doesn't happen in school. In school, the, most of the life is kept out and only kind of selected things, highly processed, are allowed in. Um, continuous breaking in from the outside. There is not no of that. And breaking out from the inside? No, students are not, you know, they're, they're supposed to just take in stuff. They are not supposed to actually do anything in the, even in that direction of breaking, breaking out from the inside. The same thing with the church. You know, the first thing you notice is that everybody is quiet. Everybody is hushed. Everybody is kind of cowed down. So there is no breaking out from the inside and breaking in from the outside. It's also very selective. It's, it's dark. It is, you know, you kind of, your heads are bowed. Um, I mean, I think I, I, I see that, you know, it's like at, at this level, you can see that as institutions, this entire, because it's like visually, it's like this process taking place, going from the center out, you know, from outside in. All those structures are to stop that movement in, in every way and just allow for trickle here and there and not go directly to the center either. It is to kind of take it somewhere else. Uh, so channel all the energy. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, so we'll go, uh, Joe, go ahead. Now, and, and the thing that I think that's so amazing about this is that he's arriving at it at such a young age. Like that's what's so incredible, like to make this discovery to go from the inside out. I mean, it, usually you have to read something like the Tao or something like that in order to understand what it is to live through nature. Mm -hmm. But he's doing this all through observation. And he's actually capturing, you know, his family's experiences beautifully as well and contrasting them with nature at the same time. And he's arriving at his own conclusion. 
So I, I, it really is kind of remarkable to think, even to, to remember the details that he's been able to do, um, because I see it like the, it's, it's a journey, but it's a journey at a very young age. And it kind of sh- speaks to a lot of what, you know, Rapalia has spoken about in the past and everybody in, in general is uh, just how much children, you know, just how uh, uh, much they can learn at such a young age. And I, I think that, that that to me is uh, um, really, I find to be the most uh, amazing thing in reading this book. It's just kind of just how advanced he is and his ability to compare and contrast and to arrive at his own conclusions, uh, which you know took me a long time. No, the, <laughs> the other, other point I want to make is that he's doing it at a certain level. So he goes, walks into the church and says, no, this is not, this is not life. Okay. He walks into the school and says, this is not life. The things that he will, he actually does not have full words for it yet. He doesn't have the full intellectual understanding. He, and he, that, that's another thing is very clear about. He's saying, look, these are all instincts at this level. I do not know. This is at the surface. I do not know why this is so. I do not know how it is structured, but no, there is something wrong here. He gets that and he has the confidence in himself. And I think, you know, hats off to his family, you know, for letting that grow to, for him to kind of work with it. Because what happens in case of most families, as soon as something like that begins to happen, Every, everybody comes on them uh, with a ton of b- bricks to destroy it. Whereas here, you know, you see, I mean, I especially like his grandfather. Okay, he's very observant. And it's like, it's that, like the Montessori ideal. Observant, caring, but gentle. Providing only when things are needed. And that too, in an indirect way, and then inviting the child to take the, take the actual steps. Not saying, okay, I'm gonna show you the sunrise. No, 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 there is such thing. And then you just watch the child go, go and figure it out for, for itself. Um, next up is going to be um, Marjorie, uh, Rupali and Jyoti. Marjorie. Uh, Yeah, um, I just uh, started uh, reading the book. I'm only about four chapters in, but um, he reminds me of uh, Walt Whitman in some ways in that, you know, the celebration of the natural world and the expression of that wonderment either through his architecture or through his writing, because you can see it, you know, his prose is, is, you know, almost poetry. Um, the other th- comment I wanted to make, though, was something that I think maybe we haven't touched on is that not all of his, I think, re- um, his uh, feelings towards his immediate family were so pure because I think we saw an ambivalence towards his father and the one hand uh, he was in awe of his father and I think that was expressed when I think he would sit when he was very young he would be next to his father fishing and he would just be in you know awe of being in his presence yet at the same time we see the description and you know I this is from his description of being an, you know, uh, an adult looking back on his childhood um, of his father being Irish and he described him in very kind of unflattering, you know, f- physical, physically unflattering terms. Now, maybe this was part of his, you know, uh, prejudice against Irish, the way it was, um, you know, um, that he absorbed during that time because he obviously had it towards um, Jews because he was in the very beginning had a, a, it was just one sentence, but a very unflattering comment about um, 
his family member dealing with the wiles of a Jew. But anyway, um, I'm, I wondered in that ambivalence how that played a role in his, um, I don't know, in his architecture or in his personal life uh, later on in life. So that may be something too interesting to explore. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. Um, I mean, what I try to do is that, um, I mean, what we're trying to do here is to look at kind of the progression of his ideas. Second thing is, is that this is a book that is written in 1800s or, or early, early 1900s. Um, so we're looking at another time. Uh, the second thing is that there is a lot going on. I mean, let's separate out both of those things. One is that he is not always positive in describing things. You can see his descriptions of the preacher. He's trying to say, what is this? And he's trying to capture it as clearly as he possibly can. Uh, and as coming back to you know, starting with the Walt Whitman, another thing that is common to him, it's, you're absolutely right that it's very, very close to Walt Whitman, his approach, his kind of ecstatic appreciation of nature. And another thing that is common to him and Walt Whitman is also appreciating the human realm. Mm -hmm. There are many, many, many thinkers and poets mm -hmm. who will speak like that of nature, but will not speak like that of human beings. Uh, he has, I mean, just like Walt Whitman, he does. Uh, so that's, that's common. In terms of this particular thing, that is a very tricky point. And we're talking about how a child, how he saw as a child at that point. So that's a very minor issue at this point. So maybe we can pick it up towards the end mm -hmm. of, of this discussion. That's what I would recommend. Because what we're trying to do is that we're trying to look at kind of the core themes here mm -hmm. of what actually formed this character and who this character is. My my point was that the you know we are shaped by early experiences and that ambivalence was an early experience towards his dad. So I'm just wondering. It's not a criticism of him. It's just I'm wondering what influence. And I'm I don't know because I haven't read the rest of the book. I'm so let us let what. us read. N neither have all of us. Yeah. Okay. So let us read the book. Is that fair? Oh, absolutely. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, next up is going to be Rupali, Jyoti, and Joe. Rupali. So uh, talking about religion, I just wanted to make another point. You know, he um, talks about the church, not in a very flattering way, but he does talk about religious stories from the Old Testament. Uh, and one of the things that children at that age, they can really imagine at a much higher level. And so the stories are important for them. And so he says, you know, it, um, the Old Testament amused and pleased him with its interesting stories of, and he could live, he could almost live them over. So he could, but he could understand the grandness of the stories, the big life, the big, um, the big events that happen in the stories. Uh, and that's true with all children. So uh, another thing to think about is, Storytelling for children is important. Thank you. Uh, on, on religion, I would add that there is more, much more than that. Uh, you know, if you look at his reaction to his grandmother's approach to religion, you can see it's very powerful. So it's, it's very positive in terms of like the core of what religion is trying to do as he sees it or his grandmother sees it is to see this individual soul, kind of sacred soul in each person and the value of that and what is possible to, to that. So at that level, at a very deep level, he is religious. He is spiritual. He, he gets those things. Even at that age, he gets those things. It's the, 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 the rituals and the trappings, which actually go against. Yeah. Was that? Yeah, exactly. The dogma. Right. Uh, and it's, and, and that Actually, he rebels against that because he sees even that as being opposed to not just his spring, but 
even the his understanding of spiritual con you know conflicts with that um next up is jyoti followed by jo no i just wanted to make this point that he was not only a astute observer like i said i think in many ways he was like a little psychologist he had studied each one of them his his constellation his family members and he had he had found out what interest them like uh, and uh, what why my grandmother uses two needles and sometimes three needles and grandfather <laughs> why can't you see the penumbra <laughs> he can read <laughs> and he has to read very close what is it? so he in his own way uh, and usually children do that they cannot speak they cannot articulate but they study each one of the parents and sometimes they they pit each other because they know that this one will irritate the other parent but in his case he uh, just took everything in he soaked everything about his grandmother grandfather and father and all that and put them respectively you know like he it, it didn't interfere it did not contradict him in any way that these people are his feelings i mean they did not get contradicted because each one of them served a different role in the household so i thought that was a little psychologist was also very interesting thank you absolutely great great point um it just uh, as i think marisa also was describing it his description of everything is quite stunning like whether it is nature or somebody making shoes or what his grandmother is like uh, just it, it just very deep and it's it's the same approach that he brings to all of them kind of both kind of deep interest and appreciation of how they are and saying okay what can i learn from this what does it mean for me how do i express that joe now you you actually just uh, captured um something that uh, earlier it was about his grandfather that you were going into because that's like kind of what made his family work you can kind of see that kind of ability to accept people for who they are and he said you know i love my grandmother because she's true it she's honest to who she is not because of all the dogma and all the other thing he was able to see past that to a certain degree and i think that his that was his grandfather impacting him directly like cuz his grandfather was very accepting as well um but this also i think this these this these diverse experiences ultimately allow him to arrive as nature is this beautiful is the most beautiful thing that you know and essentially how he arrives at form follows function actually yeah i really like the family you know it's like the family picture that emerges you know these are very independent people very they're independent doing, they're doing all the stuff and their interests are so different from each other their philosophies are very different from each other their methods are very different their um kind of proclivities kind of the net, the, the um what shall i say their um uh, the, the the psychological kind of focuses are different yet you can see that they actually care about each other very deeply yes. and they work together very effectively you know the the grandmother is the rock he's she's like the foundation of the entire family uh there the, you know there is this kind of skepticism and careful you know and kind of openness to nature that the grand grandfather has then the daughter is extremely like just she's beautiful musical very emotional very um uh what shall i say very expressive and loving and then you have the father who is kind of more practical of kind of getting things done you know he's been again you know i you have to put in context their lives you know this kid at 12 year old was abandoned at a fair <laughs> to to be left to kind of fair you know fair for himself and he did so the kind of character that you have to build for doing that is very different from his mother and you have to respect that and so there is a there is there, there's all of that kind of interaction and key um so so it's just just the interaction between these people i think i i find it really fascinating um and that they are independent beings independent thinkers uh, at a very deep level and still they they are interacting with each other that is saying a lot 
yeah, I mean, I think if it had been more dogmatic, he would have never have uh, arrived at a lot of the conclusions that he had been. Uh, again, it hadn't been such a diverse number of perspectives. Wonderful. So let's do final comments. Uh, Rupali, Joya, and Maritza. Rupali. Okay, so I'm just going to read this part. Um, now was the work done, the boundaries of his domain established, the domain his very own. His breast swelled with pride. It was all his. No other boy should ever enter those lovely precincts. No other boy could understand. Besides, he loved solitude as he loved activity and the open. I think it captures his spirit very well. Wonderful. Uh, before I go to Joya, um, so next time, we're going to do either two chapters or three chapters. I'm, going, I'm trying to decide whether, so it's going to be Newburyport and Boston 1 or Newburyport and Boston 1 and Boston 2. So I'm going to just quickly do a reading and decide. So first two for sure, but I might include the third one. If it falls naturally with, you know, the first, these three chapters, then I will do, I think let, let us by default say three chapters right now. Okay, if it changes, uh, I will change because I, I'm trying to keep all the units the same. I'm trying to keep the reading manageable, but more importantly, I'm going to keep the units the same. So we can run through a theme and then go to the next one. The following chapter after the second Boston chapter seems to be a big change. So that's why I'm thinking of putting the, you know, so let, let's just plan on three chapters. Does that make sense, folks? Okay. Uh, Joya, closing comments. Uh, my closing comments, I just wanted to read a, a part about intellect and instinct, which is something that nobody brought up yet, but this was for those of us who've been on this journey and read through kindergarten chats, this was a, an important conversation that came up and we see the, the first glimmers of this idea coming in this book. And I think it, it kind of tells us where we are here with uh, Louis Sullivan's development. He says, as a matter of fact, Louis was living almost wholly in the world of instinct. Whatever there was of intellect consisted in keen accuracy of observation and lively interest in all constructive affairs. Without reflection, he admired work, to see men at work and himself to work, especially if he could participate, was his childish joy. And so I think we're going to see how with instinct and this first beginning of intellect that comes with observation and the love of work, how that seed is going to continue to grow. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next up is Marissa. So I literally had that same exact passage that I was going to read right now. <laughs> the same exact one. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, we need to close this with the concept of instinct. So, <laughs> um, so what I'll do instead is I'll, I will um, flip it. That's the perspective from the young learner. The perspective of the outside teachers is a little more dark and it's interesting because you know the grandfather is aware that his grandson snuck out to go see the sunrise and there's a little section right before they're talking about you know Lewis living wholly in a world of instinct they say grandpa amused amazed and disturbed by this freak of his grandson feared precocity I may not know how to say that word <laughs> in much the manner that academically trained men are apt to fear manifestations of instinct. And I find that to be impactful, especially stated next to what um, Joya just read, because it shows what we still, as adults, as human beings living in today's world, we have to fight the grandpas of the world's fears in order to be true to our own instincts. And um, isn't that interesting? Wonderful. There is, there is a quote from uh, Atlas Shrugged about a young Francisco Danconia, where they go to meet somebody, some professors, and the professor's reaction is that this kid has so much capacity for a joy, so much capacity for joy, um, I do not know the exact quote after that, but this is how is he, how will he fare? How will he, how will he do in a world that has so little place for it? Uh, so it's the same kind of feeling that you have, you, you are kind of, you love this fact that there is this tremendous thing 
that is growing. And the question is, you know, you know the world and you know that there are all kinds of problems with it. So how is it going to, how is it going to function uh, there? Wonderful. All right, folks, thank you very much. I also like the fact that Rob got so much into this. I, I think he's, he's really loving this book. And um, because it is, it is a very deep book. It is a deeply philosophical book. And it is actually showing you kind of development of like ideas. How do ideas develop? So far, he doesn't have ideas. You know, he's, 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 he has instincts in the right direction. He has general pattern, you know, pattern of this flow back and forth and saying nothing should stop that. But that is still far from being able to name things, to, uh, you know, to, to, to make things. So um, really looking forward to this adventure with uh, all of you. And um, one last thing I would say is that I am learning so much from this. I mean, this is what you know, some, a great thinker does, is that no matter how many times you've read it before, Every time you read it, you get a new thing, you know, kind of a new level of understanding. And this particular format is ideal for that because I get, you know, kind of feedback and I get um, kind of your takes or take of, takes of all of you. Uh, Rupali, you wanted to say something. I was just going to say, you know, when I read the book, I read it through my experiences, my perspective, my understanding, but listening to everybody present before me, I get a completely different uh, take on things from everybody's perspective and how they see the book. So the same passages can uh, mean so much. So much. I, uh, sorry, go, go ahead. Because there's so much in each of those passages that it's not just one single meaning in there. And I do one trick to everything that you say, Rupali, okay, which I recommend for everybody, okay? Rupali always likes to talk about children. Okay. And that is all good, good and well. I really like that. Okay. I love, love what she does. But the real challenge, if you really want to take it, and that's what this book is about, is to say, you are that child. Not, it's like people will say, oh, you know what? This is what we should do for kids and think that they have gotten everything from the books. No, no, no. That's not even the point of the book. Okay. It's not about children because it, 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 it kind of, it, it actually is a diversion to say it's, it's a valid thing. Okay. I'm not saying it's not good. Okay. It's, it's great, but it's not the core of what a book has to offer a human being. Okay. What you have to do, you have to say, okay, what does this, just like Marisa was saying, like about his reaction to sunrise, you say, okay, do I have something like that? Do I feel like that? D to what extent is this process going on with me? If this is what is ideal for a kid, what would be an equivalent prepared environment for me be as an adult? What would a growth of the adult at that level scaled for your capacity, what would it look like? That is the challenge. That, so that's, that's the trick I use to everything that Rupali says, okay, how would it apply to us as individuals? All right. See you folks. Bye. <laughs>